Hello, welcome to Tokyo College's online event. I'm Haneda Masashi, director of Tokyo College. I'm excited and feel honored today uh, to have an opportunity to moderate uh, today's event. Uh, Tokyo College's events are all very special, but today's event is particularly special, special among specials, in the sense that, in a sense that we celebrate the publication of the first monograph of an early career researcher belonging to Tokyo College, Dr. Hosokawa Naoko. Uh, usually in various fields in, in the, of humanities, uh, publishing a book is very important, for an, especially for an early career researcher to proceed to the next step. But it is not easy, of course. You need to submit your uh, text uh, to publishers and negotiate with them. The seldom texts are accepted by uh, publishers. Even if a publisher accepts a text, it, is, it gets reviewed. Then the text is to be rephrased or even restructured completely following a suggestion uh, for, uh, suggestions and advices by advice by uh, reviewers. Many book projects stop at this stage and is never realized. So only a small number of uh, early career researchers are successful, successful in publishing their research achievement under the form of monograph. So that is the case of our Naoko. She just published uh, the, uh, a monograph entitled Long Words and Japanese Identity, Inundating or Absorbed this year. As one of her colleagues, I'd like to uh, congratulate her from the bottom of my heart. Her continuous effort and the spirit of never give up are really remarkable. In today's event, uh, she will introduce some uh, important points she wants to make in her uh, new book first. Then uh, two guest discussants, uh, Professor Muramoto of the University of Tokyo and uh, Professor Guane of the Autonomous University of Barcelona, Barcelona will make uh, remarks and ask some questions. After discussions uh, between Naoko and two guests, uh, we will have a question and answer session between the audience and uh, panelists so far as time allows us to do so. You can ask questions and make comments anytime by uh, using Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen, and just uh, as usual, uh, both in English and in Japanese. Both English and Japanese are okay for all your questions and remarks. So before moving to the main part of today's event, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, Professor, uh, uh, Dr. Hosokawa Naoko, today's speaker. She has been a postdoctoral fellow at Tokyo College uh, since uh, 2020. So we have been working together almost for three years. She obtained her PhD uh, from the Faculty of Oriental Studies, the University of Oxford, uh, before coming here uh, she spent a long time in Europe, worked at the School of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences, École des Étudiants Sciences Sociales, uh, in Paris, the European University Institute in Italy, and the University of Strasbourg in France. She's an expert of social linguistics, and the current research topics. The topic is the relationship between language and identity during uh, through the examination of. Uh, media discourse. So uh, let's listen to uh, Naoko's presentation. Naoko, please. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction, Professor Haneda. And um, hello, everyone. First of all, let me express my gratitude to Tokyo College who organized this event and also to give me the opportunity to work on the manuscript of this book. Without the kind support given from Tokyo College, this publication would not have been possible. And I'd like to also thank the three professors who are with me today, Professor Haneda, 
uh, who just spoke, and Professor Muramoto and Professor uh, Guarne, uh, who is connected from Barcelona. And let me also say that this book is partly based on my doctoral thesis. So I'd like to thank once again Professor Biaki Freswick at the University of Oxford, who was my uh, doctoral supervisor, and Professor John Maha and Professor Linda Flores, who are the examiners of the doctoral thesis, and Professor Jiun Kia, who is the academic editor for this book. And I'd also like to thank my colleagues and friends who give me the academic and the moral support while I was working on this manuscript. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone who is connecting today uh, from the other side of the screen. And it's a great honor for me to be able to introduce this book today. So let's start the presentation. Let me share my screen. So let me just a little bit talk about this book. So this book came in February 2023 from Routledge in UK. And the main topic of this book is language and identity. And I took an example of language debates on loanwords as an example to analyze. And I take an interdisciplinary approach. So I look at the question of language and society, language contact, language policy, but also media discourse analysis and the globalization and identities are broader framework and also um, area studies because of this focus on the Japanese society. So how it all started is this kind of conversation that we hear very often in our society. I think we use too many English words these days. We should defend our language from being inundated by unfamiliar words. I don't agree. I think it's a good sign of internationalization. New words help us absorb new knowledge. This kind of conversation is very common, not only in Japan, but everywhere in the world. But in the Japanese case, we hear this conversation surrounding the term gairaigo. So what is the term gairaigo for those who are not familiar with the Japanese language? Um, they refer to Western and recent loans, also including Japanese coined English terms, which I will talk a little bit about later on. And literally, it means words that come from outside, consisting of three characters, first referring to outside, which is a very important concept today, and to come, the second character, and the words or language in the last character. So these characters are also known as gaida, uh, katakana go, uh, words in katakana, because they are written normally in a katakana script, so visually separated from the rest of the vocabulary. And in terms of the proportion, um, gaida go is one of the three main vocabulary groups of the Japanese language, together with wago, which is a native Japanese vocabulary, and Kango, which is Sino-Japanese vocabulary. While about one third of the vocabulary is native vocabulary, the half of the vocabulary is considered to be Sino-Japanese vocabulary. And well, at least about 9% of the vocabulary is the gairai go, the long Western long words, and 8% konshugo, which is a mixture of any of the three. But this is a proportion from the dictionary entry. So in reality, uh, we would say the proportion of a uh, guide I go is much higher, uh, going somewhere between 15 to even 30%, depending on the field. So what kind of words are considered to be guide I go? So unlike the expression like anglicisms, guide I go covers a wide range of vocabularies from different languages. Uh, starting from Portuguese throne words that came from the uh, time of the Christian missionaries uh, to Dutch derived words, which came with the Dutch merchant before the opening of the country in a major period, and also a large number of English based and other European language based words that came after the major restoration uh, in the mid 19th century. Also, there are a lot of Japanese coined English terms, which are referred to as wasei ego, and they are the words that were made coined in Japan, combining English words, including words like my car, which is based on the expression my car, but it means my one's own car. So you can also use an expression like he has my car, meaning he has his own car. 
And also there are other ones such as NITA, which refers to the night game for baseball, uh, gasoline stand, which is based on the gasoline stand, but meaning petrol station. And finally, these days we have a lot of newly introduced words that are often conceptual and mostly English derived that are often discussed in the debate about whether it is desirable or not desirable. So this is the uh, main part of the discussion today. So I will discuss a little bit more later on in this presentation. So in terms of the public attitude, according to Agency for Cultural Affairs survey, uh, in 2017, about 13.7% 13, of the respondents said the use of Gaidaigo is desirable, whereas 35.6% of the respondents said the use of long words is undesirable. So you can see from 1999 on, there are always more people responding that use of guide I go is undesirable than those who had said it is desirable. Even more remarkable is that the uh, survey carried out by the Asahi Shimbu newspaper in May 2020. So the question is the recent use of guide I go tolerable about 28% of the respondents said yes, whereas 72% of respondents said no, which is quite interesting. Also, given the situation of the survey, this was the middle of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So we see a general attitude among the general public towards the use of loan words in Japanese society. Uh, it seems to be more people think it is problematic to use these words. But more than that, it is very interesting that a lot of people talk about whether or not to use this kind of words. So this is a very popular topic, uh, not only among the specialists of language, but also the general public. So why do debates about the words attract so much public attention in Japan? To answer this question, we need to think of two common assumptions and that we have in Japanese linguistics. First of all, Lomas, known as Gaidaigo, is one of the vocabulary groups in the Japanese language, which I just introduced together with other two vocabulary groups. It has a particular function within the Japanese language, so it is considered to be part of the Japanese language. However, I made a special focus, I put a special, I focused a special attention to the question, what do they mean in the popular discourse? What do they represent in the popular discourse? So I hope this is one of the contributions of this book that I ask this particular question about the symbolic representation of long words in the Japanese popular discourse. Second of all, we often look at this question about the use of long words in terms of for and against and we say those who are for the use of long words are more uh, international rural, uh, rural um, person, and those who are against the use of the words are more, perhaps a little bit purist and conservative. And there are lots of studies about what kind of social profiles impact the opinion about the long words. However, in this book, I try to look at the characteristics that are in common both among those who are for and against that use of long words. So what lies beyond this dichotomy between for and against? So I hope with these points, and uh, this book can make a unique contribution to the field of study on long words and the Japanese identity. In terms of methodology, I use textual analysis, focusing on recurrent verbal expressions, metaphors, contrast, parallels, and adjectives, I use newspaper databases to analyze uh, the discussion regarding the use of long words from 1991 to 2000, so about for 30 years uh, of discussion. And as I said Aria, I focused on non-academic discourse on language, so it is also known as folk linguistics. And this is also a meta-linguistic study, meaning a study of language used to discuss language. And meta language is considered to be important because it reveals shared norms and beliefs about language in a given society. So I analyzed um, in two parts of this discussion. And the first part is about the structure of the debates. 
I picked up 18 most recurrent verbs in the discussion, and I analyzed how these verbs are used and what they mean uh, by using these verbs. So in general, there are two types of verbs. The first verb that describes the excessive, malicious, or uncontrolled advancement of an action, including uh, to inundate, to abuse, to overissue, to surge, or to be rampant. And the second group of verbs describes an action leading to an improvement, enrichment, or flexibility, including to permeate, to accept, or to absorb. So with these two groups of verbs, they show two contrasting but complementary views about the use of loan words. So the first view is loan words are inundating the Japanese language. And second view is loan words are absorbed by the Japanese language. So this is how um, I see the two point of view about the use of loan words, which is also part of the title of this book. But what is even more interesting is that with the 18 verbs that I analyzed, there is some sort of contrast between something fluid or dynamic versus something solid and stable. So this idea of contrasting fluidity, dynamism versus solidity, stability, but something in common among all the verbs. Furthermore, uh, there were quite a few metaphors and similes related to water or liquid. So we saw already to inundate. There is also to overflow, to permeate, to flow in or to absorb. And there are some recurrent expressions like a wave of long words, a big wave of English, a flood of long words, an influx of English, long words advanced like a torrent, or like uh, long words have melted into Japanese. So there are definitely this image of fluidity expressed in this discussion. So what is symbolized by this fluidity? And also it is cont contrasted to the idea of solidity. What is symbol symbolized by solidity? This is a question. To this answer this question, I'd like to quote uh, Nanette Gottlieb, who looked at discourse regarding minority populations in Japan. And she describes minority populations as outsiders within. She says there's no fixed image about Japanese mainstream population, but in order to overcome this uncertainty about identity, they will make minority population as marginalized group. And she explained that by saying, by defining others as what, uh, what we are not, we emphasize what it is that we think we are at both at the personal and the social level, often without actually spelling it out. So using this idea, I would suggest that the loan words play a role of the outside within the Japanese language. So the Japanese language and loan words are perceived as two separate entities instead of loan words being part of the Japanese language. Therefore, the outside within is something considered to be fluid, and the Japanese language and the Japanese self is considered to be solid. Here we see foreign, Japanese foreign dichotomy as a common narrative that we find in the discussion on loan words. With that in mind, we see recurrent parallels about loan words and the Japanese language. While loan words are considered to be parallel, associated with a foreign language and Western language, they are also associated with foreign culture, Western civilization, and also internationalization and globalization as a phenomenon. It is sometimes even associated with flow of time as concept in general. On the other hand, the Japanese language is often associated with other groups of vocabulary, so the native Japanese words, wago, and the Sino-Japanese words, kango. But it is interesting to see that it is associated also with Japan as a country, and also Japanese people, Japanese culture, also history and tradition as concept. 
So we see that discussion language, discussion of language is actually discussion of culture, people, society, and values. So to summarize the first part, we have identified that two water-related metaphors, so inundating and absorbed, that we have also in the title of this book, symbolize the contrasting visions of long words, which is, are considered to be fluid in the Japanese language, which is considered to be solid. And both critics and defenders of Roma see them as being in contrast to Japanese language and synonymous to foreign culture, foreign uh, language changes our familiar concept. So we can say that different visions of Roma represent different visions of how Japanese South should deal with the other represented by Roma. So with that in mind, I also analyzed the chronological evolution of the debate. So I said that I looked at the discussion from 1991 to 2000. I divided these three uh, 30 years into four different uh, time periods and looked at how the historical background impacted the debate about the long ones. So first of all, in 1990s, if we look at the Japanese society, it was the end of Japan's bubble economy. So there is a very big loss of economic confidence. It also coincided with the beginning of the Heisei era. So after the end of the reign of Hirohito, which lasts for a long time in society, there was a sense of a new time, new era coming to the society. And in terms of language policy, it marked also the end of post-war language reforms which was the standardization of the Japanese language. So it was more based on the rules and uh, formats that was being standardized and um, uh, decide, defined. By ending this cycle of language reforms, the discussion shifted towards more moral-based discussion about what kind of language we should be speaking and what kind of role the Japanese language should play in the international society. This time also the, uh, coincided with the past development of information technology. A lot of us started using computers and mobile phones in the early 1990s. And end of the Cold War was also a very important point of the history, uh, which led to uh, rapidly growing international systems. So with that in background, what kind of loan words were discussed? We found words like word processor, computer, which are related to information technology, forum, symposium, which are related to international systems. So there are many international organizations held, holding a lot of international meetings. And also there are some words related to the new business models. So uh, we saw the words like convenience store, which came to Japan from America in 1960s, but the large change started to develop in Japan in 1990s. And there are also words like uh, company restructuring, expressed as a ristora in Japanese. And this was also considered to be a new word uh, in Japan where the lifetime employment was commonplace previously. So where uh, in this um, background, Japanese language was often described as correct. So the question when they were asking in terms of the use of long words is, is it correct or is it appropriate? Behind this question, there is a Japanese society having um, to find a place within the new global system. So we can interpret that the question about the appropriateness of loan words as a proxy for the question about the newly introduced information technology and the new global system. So in the late 1990s, the nature of discussion developed further. So in terms of Japanese society, there was a big uh, great Hanshin earthquake in 1995. And there was a new language reform proposal in 1997, uh, given by then the uh, health minister, Junichiro Koizumi, uh, proposing to simplify the language used in public offices so that general public can better access the information. In response to that, there is nationwide survey on loan words from 2002 to 2006 by the National Institute for Japanese Language and Linguistics. 
with that also Japanese society was facing a rapid aging society so with the uh, total fatality rate hitting a record low in 2005 so the people made uh, give attention to uneven information sharing between the government and citizens specialists and non-specialists doctors and patients young and old and so on with that globalization advanced fast as well with that background the words that were frequently discussed as long words include day service home helper which are related to elderly care but also there were some words such as digital divide which give um, questions this uh, unequal uh, distribution of information and there's some multinational global uh, corporate jargon such as incentive compliance which were previously not very familiar with the Japanese companies and there were more conceptual words as well such as identity moral hazard globalization and in terms of the Japanese language they were uh, it was often described as easy to understand so wakariyasui and the question in terms of the use of long words asking was do we understand it so behind this question there was a need to comply with unfamiliar global norms and values of the time so we can understand that the question about the clarity of long words or democratic communication as a proxy for questions about the new global norms and values in the late 2000s and the nature of the debate on Loma changed once again when Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was elected for the first time with the first cabinet in 2006. Um, in his first cabinet, he was known to use a lot of long words and new expressions. So it included country identity, which was expressed in long words, so in katakana. And also his political slogan was beautiful country. And this wasn't expressed in katakana, but he had this idea of beautiful country as his slogan. And there is a lot of criticism about uh, the overuse of long words by the uh, government. And they were often saying these words do not correspond to the political slogan of beautiful country because uh, these words are not beautiful. So we can understand that the beauty as a symbol of alternative values that cannot be measured objectively. So after losing the economic uh, confidence and facing a fast developing international system, um, there is a struggle to establish a unique value of the Japanese society, which can be the pillar of new Japanese identity. So from that background, we see words such as innovation, manifesto, tourism, as new uh, focus of the Japanese diplomacy and politics. And there are also newly coined terms like Asia Gateway or Live Talk, which um, the government created to make um, new political um, catchphrases. And as I said earlier, there is this word country identity often discussed in the debate on long words, which is also interesting that it is not used, um, it is not the same as the national identity. So they are trying to make an alternative way of creating national identity by using a new word, the country identity. So in this context, the Japanese language is often uh, described as beautiful. And the question regarding the language was, is this beautiful? And we see the need to define new values and identities in this context. So we can say that question about the beauty of long words as a proxy for a question about alternative values and identities for Japan. Finally, 2010s, we see a lot of new events happening. So there are quite a few natural disasters, including Great East Japan earthquake and the Fukushima nuclear power plant accident in 2011 and the Kumamoto earthquakes in 2016. Towards the end, there was an outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. At the same time, the number of foreign residents and tourists hit a record high in 2019, just before the closing of the borders uh, because of the pandemic. So then again, the people's attention moved to importance of equal distribution of information, not only to those in all age groups, but also people of all nationalities. There was this idea that Japanese language is not only spoken by the Japanese people, but also by 
people with other nationalities. There was the initiative on Yasashi Nihongo, which is a kind, easy Japanese or kind Japanese plain words uh, initiative, which is the project to simplify the Japanese language to help people who do not uh, speak Japanese uh, very fluently. And this project started to gain public interest as well. At the same time, in the framework of loan words discussion, people started to talk about Japanese words as loan words used abroad, including tsunami, manga, karaoke, and so on. From this background, we see the nature of loan words discussed frequently changing to words like hazard map, lifeline, uh, false rumor, fake news related to natural disasters and pandemic, and also new um, values in the Japanese political agenda, such as sustainability, inbound, full Japan, diversity. And we also see after 2020, was related to the COVID pandemic, such as corona, overshoot, cluster, pandemic, social distance, and lockdown. And the Japanese language is often described as easy or kind, as I mentioned earlier, with the adjective yasashi, meaning several different things, easy, kind-hearted, soft, or gentle. And when they talk about the word uh, in uh, long words, they ask questions, do they understand it? So not only do we understand it, but do they understand it is the new question. And we see behind this question, a need to diversify and international, internationalize domestic communities in Japan. So we can understand that the question about accessibility of long words as a proxy for questions about growing diversity within the Japanese society. So to summarize, we can see that debates about the long words reflect actually the turning points and challenges for Japanese society and also fluctuating values. And the chronological evolution of the long words debate can be seen as a record of Japan's struggle to renegotiate its identity. We see that long words discussed in each period frequently symbolize new challenges and opportunities that the Japanese society was facing at that time. So this was the finding. And we have been focusing on the Japanese society so far. Is this unique to Japan? So the question about the use of loan words is not at all uh, the unique problem in Japan. We see a lot of different societies facing the same question. And some countries have stricter attitude towards the use of long words. So to, to give a few examples, uh, in Quebec, in Canada, they penalize the use of foreign words uh, in certain communications such as commercial advertising and public signs and posters with uh, fine, possible fine from $1,500 to $20,000. And there was a case in 2013 that the government investigated an Italian restaurant for violating this law by using the word pasta. In the end, they did not find the restaurant because there was protest by the restaurant's owners and they said there's an exception. But it is interesting that it became a scandal like this. And only a few weeks ago, we saw this news story from Italy that the Italian government is proposing to ban the use of foreign words in official communication with fines ranging from 5,000 euros to 100,000 euros. This law hasn't passed yet, but we see that question is still very much um, timely. However, as we say that question on loan was is a reflection of society. So each society has different characteristics in discussing loan was. So I looked at the French discourse on loan was as comparative study. In France, discussion on loan was, in particular, English derived was, has been gathering a lot of attention. As early as in the uh, 1960s, there was this discussion about the Fongle with the literary, uh, literary critic René Etienne uh, writing a book, Parlez vous Fongle, so do you speak anglicisms basically? And he's ex uh, describing the situation as invasion of France by Yankee vocabulary. So he is focusing on American English. Today, there is a law, the Tubon law, in France that makes it obligatory to use the French language in the government, publication, advertisement, and commercial contracts. As a result, 
you see here on the screen the poster for Rum Havana Club, which has the catch copy saying Cuba made me. This doesn't make much sense. This is just a catch copy. But because of this law, they have to have an asterisk on top of this expression and put at the very bottom of the poster in a very small print, just above saying alcohol can harm your health. It has to give a French translation, Cuba, Mafe. There's also the Commission for Enrichment of the French Language to propose French terms to replace Anglicism. So they are working very hard politically on, on the use of long words to be controlled. So to compare with the Japanese situation, I looked at the association with long words in the French case. And in French discourse, long words are often associated with particular Anglophone countries, especially America. So they use expressions like Americanisms, Californianisms, Anglo-Saxons, Anglo-Saxon economic supremacy, Anglo-Saxon world, American imperialism, American domination, American practices. Also, they often discuss fear of globalization and internationalization, such as hegemonic English, globalization, and language globalization as globish, internationalization, global pidgin, linguistic invasion, new linguistic imperialism. It is also remarkable that there is more focus on business and economic sectors in France compared to Japan, where there is a more focus on public administration and politics sector. They talk about long word as vocabulary of business language, uh, business and language of marketing, corporate jargon, corporate culture, language of Harvard Business School. One commonality is that they also talk a lot about generational and other social divides. So they describe long words as language of the youth, neologisms, slang, language of the suburbs, social and generational divide, and trendy language. So there are both similarities and differences in two cases. So in both cases, national language, so French for France and Japanese for Japan, is described as comprehensible, beautiful, pure, familiar, traditional, and appropriate to criticize the use of long words and vigorous, hospitable, and flexible to defend the use of long words. Whereas long words are described as incomprehensible, ambiguous, threatening to criticize the use of long words, whereas new, enriching, and international to defend the use of long words. But the remarkable differences include that in the case of France, there was a frequent reference to specific countries and languages, so particularly English and American English in particular, and also business English. And also international status of English as hegemonic and dominant, which interestingly was not discussed very often in the case of Japan. There is also reference to other Francophone countries like Quebec or the French Academy, the famous Academy Francaise, as a police or guard for their language. And as I said earlier, there is stronger association with business and finance uh, with English based alone words. And interestingly, in the case of France, the metaphors are more often military and political related, such as invasion, colonialism, imperialism, police, and guard. Whereas in Japan, the metaphors are more related to water and liquid. So in conclusion, we go back to the question that we asked at the beginning of this presentation. What do long words represent in Japanese popular discourse? So they do not normally encompass all words of foreign origin, unlike the official definition of the term, but only some newly introduced and unassimilated words of the time. So they are contingent on changes taking place within Japanese society. And they are a symbol of otherness, often described in terms of fluidity and contrasted to the Japanese language's perceived solidity. So how is the Japanese language defined in the popular discourse? It is defined in relation to long words. So each individual defines their own notion of the Japanese language by take, talking about the long words based on various different narratives constructed to describe the relation between long words and the Japanese language. So inundating or absorbed, they express their views about the Japanese language. And what lies beyond the for and against dichotomy, there's a common view held by everyone, which is the role of self assigned to the Japanese language 
and the role of the other assigned to loan was creating this dichotomy between native and foreign. And this is common by both defenders and critics of loan was. So the essence of national identity is understood through the symbolic represent representation of self and the counter representation of the other. So why do debates about the loan was attract so much public attention? Because it is about question of identity. So what is really discussed is the set of core values that are through uh, that were thought to define Japanese identity in response to the changing domestic and international environment and the growing international internal and external diversity. So with these findings, what do we need now? I think now we need a multifaceted approach to language rather than this Japanese native versus lower foreign dichotomy. To end my presentation, I'd like to cite an ecologic journalist, Fred Pierce, who didn't write at all about language, he wrote about ecosystem. But I find this argument quite relevant to language, but also society in general. So he said, we all like a simple story with good guys and bad guys, and the aliens always make easy enemies. Native is good and alien is bad, but why is this simple? Is this simple formula true? He also says most of the world now is composed of novel mixture of native and alien species, happily getting along together, enriching our lives, maintaining the ecosystem and recharging nature's batteries. So he proposes that alien species be considered the new wild. And we do not think in terms of native species and alien species, but we think in terms of sustainability. I think we can also apply this to the question of language and not think, by not thinking whether native or foreign, we can work on the idea of language, which can be democratic and clear to everyone. So here um, I end my presentation. So to end the presentation, uh, Routledge kindly provided me with this poster with a discount code for uh, this book. Uh, this book is available worldwide from their website. So if you are interested, please uh, check it out. And of course, if you have any questions or comments, I'll welcome them also by email. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Nako, for your uh, excellent presentation. It was uh, concise but very clear, and I understand very well the content of your book and the stress, uh, the points you want to stress in your book. Although uh, I have already offered a copy of the book, but uh, uh, I uh, need to read once again uh, uh, the, the the book itself. Uh, you have already explained a lot on uh, the content. But I believe that the, the book is much more dense and thick uh, in its content. So let's uh, uh, move on to uh, discussion session. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, uh, the first uh, discussant, uh, Professor Muramoto Yukiko. Oh, she's uh, a professor at the School of Humanities and Sociology uh, at the University of Tokyo and an expert of so, uh, social psychology. And she is now uh, uh, working on dynamic process to form and maintain cultural norms and customs. Professor Muramoto, please. Thank you very much, uh, Haneda-sensei, for your kind introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Yukiko Muramoto. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to celebrate the launch of Dr. Hosokawa's new book, uh, today, in today's presentation, please uh, let me call you Naoko. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, okay. Okay, today I would like to discuss the appeal of this book from the perspective of my specialty, social psychology. This is the overview of my presentation. I believe that Naoko's work 
can be understood within the framework of a socio-ecological approach in psychology. Her work has succeeded in overcoming the methodological difficulties of this approach that many psychological studies have encountered. In my commentary, I will explain the reason why I think so, and then ask a certain questions regarding the future direction of her research. The socio-ecological approach in psychology investigates how the mind and behavior are shaped in part by natural and social habitats, and how natural and social habitats are in turn shaped partly by the mind and behavior. Researchers aim to demonstrate that the socio-ecological environment and the individual mind define and build upon each other in an ongoing cycle of mutual constitution. This is the theoretical model of and the ongoing cycle of mutual constitution between the socio-ecological environment and the individual mind. The socio-ecological environment is made up of a variety of ecological, economic, and historical factors, such as natural disasters, population density, territorial conflict, and resource scarcity. The process of this micro-macro dynamics is often mediated by the mesoscopic phenomena. Individuals are in, impacted by the socio-ecological environment in which they live, and they create socio-cultural products, such as language, educational systems, politics, and religion, and so on, that are adaptive to the envi environment. In turn, these socio-cultural products influence individuals' minds and behavior. Researchers in this field have conducted cross-national surveys based on this model and obtained supportive results. However, most of these empirical studies in psychology have only demonstrated the correlations among the variables in these three dimensions. The processes by which they influence each other have really been investigated owing to methodological difficulties. This is because it generally takes a long time to observe changes, to method, uh, changes in the environmental factors and sociocultural products. And it is difficult to track the process of change within a limited research period. As I mentioned earlier, I believe Naoko's work fits well within this framework. In this book, she aims to clarify the ongoing cycle of mutual constitution among the various socio-ecological environmental factors, language as a socio-cultural product, and identity. I believe that by using two research perspectives, her work has been successful in demonstrating the macro-micro dynamics. The two perspectives will be discussed in the next section. The research's longitudinal perspective is its first and most important element. This book highlights the process of identity transformation over the last 30 years by focusing on the environmental factors and the debates surrounding loanwords in each time period. Tracking changes in the overall structure of a language would take too long because she focused on the process of loanword acceptance or prevention. She was able to capture the changes over a relatively short period of 30 years. This was a valuable contribution, I think. To give an example, in the past 30 years, Japan has experienced two major earthquakes. The Great Hanshin Awaji earthquake in 1995 
and the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011. In both cases, there was debate regarding the use of loan words in public information, but even similar events have not had the same consequences on identity. This book, Naoko's book, provides valuable insights into the various changes that occurred during this period. And the second point concerns the cross-cultural perspective. This book highlights the different ways of constructing or reconstructing identity through a comparison of Japanese and French. This is a, a rough summary of Naoko's argument regarding the French and Japanese discourse on loan words. As she explained them clearly in her book and also in her lecture today, I will not repeat them here. Instead, I'd like to, to show you a very uh, rough graphic representation of her argument as I understand it. In French, uh, loan words are generally of English origin and perceived as outsiders to be eliminated. The boundary separating the inside and outside of French is clear and firm. As for Japanese, on the other hand, the boundary separating inside and outside is not as solid as it appears at first glance. And long words flow slowly inward like sleeping water. Her arguments remind me of a statement by social psychologist, Professor Hazel Rose Marcus. She was my supervisor when I attended Stanford University as a postdoctoral fellow. The following statement was made by her to Dr. Hiroshi Azuma, a Japanese uh, developmental psychologist, who in turn introduced it in his book. Professor Marcus said, when Americans listen to others, they listen with their minds filled with their own thoughts, while the Japanese listen by creating a blank space in their minds. Professor Azuma interprets her words this way. While Americans always listen to others with a yes or a no attitude, the Japanese listen without adopting such a gatekeeping attitude. The Japanese take what they hear from others into a blank space into their minds and later compare it with their own opinions stored in the back of their minds. Professor Marcus is one of the best known social psychologists with her work on culture and the self, which she developed with Professor Shinobu Kitayama at Michigan University. The construct of the self uh, in their model reflects the ways in which an individual interacts with others and the environment. Their argument suggests that people in Western societies tend to believe that they are unique, bounded, and separate from the content. In contrast, East Asians tend to believe that they are contextual, uh, relational, and embedded in the context. I think there are certain parallels between Naoko's work and this psychological model, but at the same time, I believe that Naoko's work offers two interesting suggestions not assumed in this model. The first is that Japanese may be holding outsiders within their language and identity rather than simply having an interdependent relationship with others. The second is that these views of the self are not stable, but rather change within the same culture. I believe her insights provide a valuable perspective for future research in this field we definitely need a process model. In all, I'm very impressed with the interdisciplinary nature of Dr. Hosokawa's research. I believe that uh, her claims are supporting empirical findings have significant implications, not only for linguistic, but also for psychology and of course, many other research areas. 
So uh, finally, I'd like to ask Naoko a couple of questions. The first question is about the role of katakana in our perception of long words. In modern Japanese language, katakana is a label indicating that the word is of foreign origin. Do you think katakana play, has played a unique role in our perception of the otherness of long words? In other words, do you think katakana could be a contributing factor to its indicating the othering of long words? If so, do you think the process of othering of long words is unique to Japanese language? Actually, I have no idea. So if you have some suggestions, so it would be very appreciated. And the second question is about the possibility of future investigation or future uh, research. It, I think it would also be useful to distinguish between different actors, such as politicians, governments, uh, media, and the general public, and consider and analyze these interaction. In traditional societies, the main creators of sociocultural products have been uh, politicians, governments, and some professionals or experts who have often transmitted their messages uh, to the public through mass media. Today, however, ordinary people have social media and are becoming increasingly powerful creators. Such uh, top-down and bottom-up diffusion processes often produce different results. So discourse analysis may be very useful to track these processes and may help us understand the process of national identity formation as well as the diffusion process of long words. So I'd like to uh, ask you uh, opinion. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. So thank you very much and congratulations of your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Murawato, for your uh, excellent uh, remark and uh, very good questions. Uh, what do you respond to Professor Muramoto? Uh, Naoko, please. Thank you very much, Professor Muramoto, for a very interesting remarks and also very interesting questions. So of course, a uh, question of identity is deeply related to psychology and social psychology. So it is very useful for me to uh, listen to your remarks about uh, this different level analysis of psychology, micro, macro, and mesoscopic. So I'd like to um, answer uh, your questions. So first of all, regarding the use of katakana, uh, it is absolutely very important that we have a separate set of uh, orthographic system to write Western loan words. And that is why we have this uh, expression of katakana go, which is used as synonymous to gaidai go. And it visually distinguish these words from the rest of the Japanese pop, uh, vocabulary. And that is creating this dichotomy between the Japanese language, including hiragana, katakana, uh, hiragana and Chinese characters kanji, and the katakana are something in between foreign and um, no words. So it definitely does play a very important role. And also this distinction between written horizontally and vertically. So this visual differentiation is also very important. So even though nowadays we can write Japanese language horizontally as well, traditionally Japanese language was written vertically. So there is this, this distinction of yokogaki, which is a horizontal writing, which is used also as synonymous to long words. So this idea of uh, horizontality, um, visual distinction of katakana, this visual um, element is very important in having this border between the native and the foreign uh, differentiation. And also it is interesting that I mentioned earlier that the Japanese words used in uh, other countries is often mentioned in the recent trends. So we talk about the words such as tsunami, manga, karaoke used in English or any other languages. And actually in this kind of discussion, these Japanese words are written using katakana script to mark that these are the words seen from an outsider's view. So actually the use of katakana is also making a difference in terms of the perception of Japanese vocabulary. 
And it can also be seen in other laws that such as place names. So sometimes the place names like Fukushima, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, or some famous people's names like uh, Kitano Takeshi or uh, Sakamoto Ryuichi, these internationally famous uh, people, their names are written in katakana to show that their uh, recognition is international. So actually, katakana is playing a role to distinguish between the Japanese vocabulary and the foreign perceived vocabulary, but also this eyes of Japanese audience on, and also the eyes of international audience. So um, the absolutely that um, visual distinction is very important. And perhaps the equivalent in uh, other languages can be italics, but it is much less uh, remarkable. So I think this um, katakana is one of the um, main characteristics in terms of the long last treatment in the Japanese language. And regarding the second point about the different actors, um, you are absolutely right in saying that it used to be the language makers used to be government or media, um, news media or media creators and also academics. So they are, so to say, the specialists. However, nowadays, because of the development of social media, uh, now everyone, general public, uh, is um, accessing um, a lot of um, data source and they can be the, um, the outputters of the language. So now uh, I am interested in analyzing the social media contents and also different sources of language. So not only uh, officially published um, guidelines and regulations about language, but also um, the individual views about the language would be very interesting. And also uh, in terms of different uh, actors, um, of course, there have been a lot of political um, engagement in terms of uh, special field, use of special field, in, uh, use of language in special field. So, of course, the democratic communication is one of the uh, most important issues regarding the use of long words. And immediately after the survey on long words, um, in 2002 to 2006, there was also a survey about the medical jargon used in the medical field and how uh, patient as general public mm -hmm. understand the words. And there have been efforts to uh, democratize, simplify these expressions so that everyone can understand it. And of course, uh, there is also initiative of Easy Japanese um, to help uh, non-Japanese speakers to understand the Japanese language uh, without relying on the another common language like English to communicate with each other. So there are many different possibilities for um, communications with different people from different fields or different uh, backgrounds. And I think it is now very important to look at these issues, not only by drawing boundaries between Japanese and non-Japanese, but we can be a specialist in one field and non-specialist in another field. So we should take this issue as a democratic language, sustainable democratic language. And there are many interesting issues to look at that I wish to continue working on in my future research. Thank you very much. You have some, uh, again, you have some response, Professor Muramoto, to Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Uh, as for my first question, so your insight uh, regarding the katakana suggests that it is not on, not only the matter just just a matter of human psyche, but the structure of language itself may uh, play an important role for identity transformation among Japanese. So in this, uh, it, it it means that the uh, micro macro dynamics is uh, important. Uh, so yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much. And as for the second question, as a social psychologist, I'm interested in how socially shared beliefs and social representations are created in the micro-macro dynamics. So uh, in many cases, the shared image of national identity may not necessarily uh, be equal to the summation of personal beliefs. So uh, it, it would be very uh, important to uh, focus on the this macro, uh, not only macro, but also the microscopic uh, individuals' beliefs and it, and the how uh, these beliefs are uh, transformed into the socially shared beliefs. So maybe uh, 
I hope uh, we have some collaborate with the interdisciplinary research in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, between Naoko and me, we have already discussed a lot about the fact uh, that uh, katakana's usage was completely different before the Second World War. Uh, many intellectuals in those days used rather katakana than hiragana uh, to, ex to express their thought. Uh, katakana was lar largely used not only to explain or to, uh, to uh, not only for, for the use of uh, foreign languages, uh, long words, but also uh, for everyday use. Mm. So something happened after the Second World War, defeat of the Second World War. Uh, what do you think about this change of, uh, I'll say, uh, orthography? Uh, it could contribute to uh, make uh, that Japanese mindset completely change or uh, completely changed the perception of the world, uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese perception of the world. What do you think about this, Naoko? Yes, thank you very much for this comment. Absolutely. Yes, so katak the role of katakana has not been always the same as it is today. And it was very uh, different before uh, the standardization and all the language reforms has completed. So as you say, uh, it is after the war that the, uh, the language reform has completed in terms of the standardization of the use of uh, scripts and orthographic rules. And then the use of katakana was uh, limited to certain things officially, uh, such as long words and also mimetics and some of the scientific names for plants. But overall, uh, we associate a lot uh, the character of uh, the scripts of katakana with long words. And of course, standardization of language has a lot to do with the identification of the national language, so national identity. And by having this very um, set rules, very clearly defined rules about the use of language and the use of scripts, and we have a very clear idea about our national language as source of national identity. So I think that contributed to at least a contemporary discussion on long, uh, use of long words, uh, st strongly associated with this visual represent representation of a katakana, which would have been very different before the language reform uh, in the uh, modern uh, period. So thank you very much. Okay, for thank this. you very much. The time, the, the time, it seems that the time is now running out, so I need to uh, introduce uh, the next uh, discussant, Professor Bray Gorne. Uh, he is an associate professor at the East Asian Studies of Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain, and uh, he is a cultural anthropologist specialized in Japan. Uh, he visited uh, uh, Japan many times, so and even spent some time at the, uh, at the Department of Cultural Anthropology uh, in the University of Tokyo. Uh, good morning, Professor uh, Guarne. Uh, could you start your uh, comments? Thank you. Many thanks for your words, Dr. Haneda. Greetings from Barcelona and greetings from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. I'd like to start my commentary by thanking Dr. Haneda and Dr. Kusokawa from Tokyo College for inviting me to take part in this session. For me, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here today with all of you, albeit online, and participate in this joint discussion with Dr. Muramoto from the University of Tokyo. I'm sharing my screen with you. I uh, thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoy Dr. Kusokawa's presentation and reading her book. I have been following her research from some time now in a highly stimulating and productive mutual intellectual exchange and long words and Japanese identity inundating or absorbed is a fascinating book in which Dr. Hosokawa offers a masterful exploration in how the debate around the Japanese language is intimately linked to the discussion on national identity of Japan. To do this, Dr. Hosokawa uses two eloquent images. The first one is that long words are inundating the Japanese language. And the second, that long words are being absorbed by this language. While the first image expresses the social concerns regarding what is considered an excessive and overwhelming presence of long words, mainly coming from English, 
The second image expresses a view that understands the social use of loan words as a necessary part of an open society in a globalized world. In other words, a defensive attitude as compared with an innovative one. We could even say a conservative nationalist attitude vis-a-vis -a, -vis a liberal internationalist one. But Dr. Hosokawa goes beyond these dichotomous positions and their dualistic analytical frameworks of pros and cons expressed by the Japanese public opinion to focus on the public debate around them as a social phenomenon that expressed the marked concerns of Japanese society regarding its national identity. In so doing, Dr. Hosokawa offers a fascinating reflection about how the discussion around the use of Kairaigo reflects, in fact, the continuous renegotiation of Japanese identity in a complex and rapidly changing world. Therefore, Dr. Hosokawa show us that when we talk about language, and this is important, we are never just talking about language, but rather about politics, culture, identity, and with regard to the subject of our discussion today, otherness. An otherness which is seen both as a culturally threatening presence and as a condition of possibility for identity itself. It is in, in connection with this topic uh, that I would like to talk about two ideas that I consider key in Dr. Hosokawa's book. Firstly, the social view of Gairaigo as an other in contrast to a Japanese self that is neither autonomous nor clearly delineated. And secondly, the dual vision of the presence of Gairaigo in the Japanese language through its social images as an inundation or as an absorption. Well, starting with the latter, I want to say that I find the metaphor of Gairaigo as floating water particularly interesting because it precisely situates the debate in the duality that characterizes the social view of the long words presence in the Japanese language. This duality, and specifically the analysis of its result, that is ambivalence, is a key element in my own research work, which is focused on the writing of Gairaigo in Katakana. The ambivalence of writing a long word in Katakana in what I call a contradictory orthographic habitus, a la Bourdieu, that at the same time as it reflects the phonetic and morphological adaptation of a foreign word to the Japanese language, it is represented in a particular script that shows its difference. As I have explained on other occasions, the katakana orthographic practice acquires its full meaning in the light of the modern construction of the Japanese nation state and its modern imposition of an exclusive and homogeneous ideology of Japanese ethnicity that erase the linguistic and cultural diversity inherent in pre-modern Japan. We're talking about orthography, and it is always worth remembering here that far from being a neutral system of correspondences between language and writing, the orthographic practice constitutes a powerful political instrument that materializes dominant linguistic ideologies and a specific national identity constructions. Okay, focusing special, specifically on the representation of Gairaigo, which is what we are discussing today, we could say that its katakana orthography traces an ambivalent and contradictory gesture, both adapting a word to the point that it cannot be recognized in its original language and marking it out as foreign. The more a word is Japanized, let's say Japanized, the more it is represented as different in a contradictory move that accentuates difference from its very extinction. We can explain this duality in the ambivalence, coexistence of the linguistic and cultural dynamics, dynamics of foreignization, that is differentiation, alienation, estrangement, and nativization, that is acculturation, domestication, indigenization. From an anthropological point of view, we can see in this duality the complexity of the encounter between languages and cultures that Mary Louise Pratt describes in her notion of contact zone, that is, a social space, I quote, where disparate cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in highly asymmetrical relations of domination and subordination, such as colonialism and slavery, end of quote. Uh, we will come back to the issue of colonialism later, a little bit later. Another way of approaching this is not so much through contact as through 
delineation, delineation, as in the classical work of Frederick Barth on cultural identity, in which he makes a claim for the place of the border of the fringe as a space in which cultural differences, rather than dilute in a progressive process of uniformization, are established and renewed, just as Katakana does when writing a foreign war. It is not by chance that both Pratt and Barth turn to the field of linguistics to form arguments regarding this issue. Pratt, Mary Louise Pratt, takes the idea of contact zone from the pidgin languages that arise in colonial contexts. And Barth does the same with his notion of cultural diacritic, a diacritical mark that reinforces the cultural differences between ethnic groups in border areas. If we consider these approaches, we find ourselves in orthographic terms in the place of the hyphen, a place where we are confronted to face the challenge of the hybrid and the hyphenated identities that, for instance, we find in the guide of the notion of half, half, both in its meaning and its script. That is the image of what is insufficiently Japanese and insufficiently foreign. In other words, neither one thing nor the other, but both at the same time, half Japanese and half other in an impossible transformation to be completed, tentative and in process, cursive, forever in italics, like the metalinguistic uses of the Katakana script. It is in this space of contact and border of assimilation, assimilation and differentiation, or to put it in Dr. Hosokawa's words, of absorption and inundation in which cultural identities resolve in linguistic terms. Only in this liminal and in-between space, it is possible to recognize what is fully normative or generally Japanese. And we can recall here what Marilyn Ivey coins the hypervaluation of difference, the hypervaluation of difference in her analysis of the difficulties of asserting Japan's difference from a West with which it's inextricably linked. Well, actually it is very appealing, intellectually speaking, to view Japan as a post-colonial society, even though it was never formally colonized. But what I want to point out here is not so much whether katakana can be considered a script for representing a difference with colonial or pseudo-colonial implications, a topic in which I'm currently working on, but rather the desire to recognize the difference in its script, a desire that never ends in its orthographic practice. All this lets me to point out something obvious, but necessary. Ultimately, the notion of foreign war only makes sense in a different language to the one a particular word is supposedly to come from. And here we might ask ourselves, following James Stanlow, why we speak about long words when in fact long words are not long words at all, as nothing is really borrowed and of course nothing is given back. This requires a rethinking of the alleged otherness that encapsulates the very notion of Gairaigo and recognize in its Katakan orthography, not the writing of an other with uh, Brighton, uh, Britain with a capital O, but the writing of an other that I quote here, Homi Baba, is never outside or beyond us, that emerges forcefully within cultural discourses when we think we speak most intimately and indigenously between ourselves, end of quote. In other words, a difference that far from representing the absolute otherness of alterity or delineating the vindicating sameness of identity, distorts both ideas as underlined by Caldeira when she writes, I quote, there is no otherness in the sense that there is no fixed other. There is no position of exteriority as there are also neither stable identities nor fixed locations, end of quote. And drawing on all these, I would like now to end my commentary by formulating a couple of questions to contribute to the debate. First, and continuing with these last ideas, in her book, Dr. Hosokawa draws a revealing analogy between the role of minority populations and that of longwords, both which are seen as internal order or outsider within. I wonder how the increase in social awareness that Japan is a multicultural society, overcoming the myth of the uh, ethnic homogeneity, might affect the redefinition of this vision of Gairaigo as a linguistic order in the coming years. This would be my first question. Following this idea, I would also 
uh, ask uh, Dr. Kusokawa, Naoko, if you think that uh, as societies, multicultural awareness grows, if you think that Japan as a multicultural society uh, grows, these images of inundated or absorbed, these inundated or absorbed conceptions will change and therefore will change the paradigm of the national language as a reflection of the national, national state. Finally, in terms of photography and also following Dr. Muramoto insights, I would also like to know what role you think the orthography of Vairago in Katakana plays in relation to the images, in this case, to the images of inundation or absorption, analyze it in your book. And what role could be played here by increasingly writing of Gairaigo in Romaji or even on direct incorporation of words in their original languages in alphabet? Well, Many thanks for your attention. I have enjoyed very much reading Dr. Hosokawa's book. Congratulations for your book, Naoko. Uh, and I, I am now very looking forward to joining the discussion with all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gorne, for your excellent comments and questions. And Naoko, it's your turn to respond to, to him, please. Thank you very much, Professor Guarani, for your wonderful comments and a very interesting insight from your specialized field in anthropology. And I think anthropology has a lot um, to offer to this question of long words and also national identity. So I really thank you for your insights. So to answer your question, so first question about the diversity uh, growing in the Japanese society. As I mentioned, as a trend in the last 10 years or 20 years or so since the 1910s, there has been an increasing mentioning of Japanese language seen from the point of view of non-Japanese population. So there has been discussion about diversity within the Japanese society. And that is why the people are saying long words, the use of long words might be more difficult for foreigners to understand or in the framework of this Yasashi Nihongo project to uh, simplify the Japanese language by avoiding certain long words. So there is definitely the tendency in which the general public is aware of the internal diversity within the Japanese society. But I think there is probably one more step towards uh, the real diversity within the society that now there seems to be still the boundary between us, the Japanese speakers, and them, non-Japanese speakers, and we are trying to communicate with them. So the boundary seems to be very visible as well, and they are constructing the narratives of uh, how do we make Japanese language accessible to uh, non-Japanese people. So in terms for the uh, in order for the Japanese society to be truly diverse and truly cosmopolitan, I think it, what is necessary is also removing this boundary between uh, the Japanese and the foreign, as I found also in the narratives of the long ones and try to discuss in terms of, is it clear, am I speaking clearly to other people, uh, whether Japanese or not, whether specialist or not, uh, whether coming from certain field or not. So I think there has been a change in public um, viewpoints in terms of this diversity, but I think it is still in the way of uh, developing. And in terms of the image of uh, inundation and absorption, uh, surely if we do manage to uh, remove or overcome this binary um, view of Japanese and foreign, of course, this view of inundation and absorbed would be uh, different because by thinking inundation, we are thinking the relationship between the two things. That, for example, if we think of an image of uh, flooding river, uh, there's a river water and a river bank and river water is compared to long words, and the river bank is compared to the Japanese language. So if we do uh, overcome this very bi uh, binary, dichotomous view, uh, this image would also change, I believe. And finally, in terms of the use of orthography katakana and also uh, other ways of uh, transcribing long words such as uh, Roman alphabets, uh, it is true that, as you mentioned in your presentation, uh, this use of katakana plays a very interesting role, which I'd like to also uh, develop my research on, that at the same time, it refers to, it describes something foreign, and it also about draw boundaries from uh, something Japanese. 
But at the same time, by putting it in katakana, it is also drawing a boundary between something completely foreign and something slightly internalized. In fact, we have an expression, katakana ego, katakana English, meaning Japanese person speaking bad English or Japanese version of English. So they have this, this um, association between katakana being not completely foreign either. So I think this is a very interesting element that we have both um, distinguishing function of katakana, but also some internalizing function of katakana. And nowadays we do see in the linguistic landscape of Japan as well, a lot more Roman alphabet. So there is also a way to write uh, English terms or other foreign uh, terms uh, in, uh, in Roman alphabet or in other ways to write. So there is a growing diversity in terms of orthography as well. So it is interesting, perhaps the role of katakana will develop and evolve in coming years to more creative tool uh, for the orthography. So that is also a very interesting topic for the future research as well. Thank you very much for your comment. Any response from uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Guarne? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for for your answer, uh, Dr. Fusokawa Naoko. Uh, I think it's very interesting, all these issues. And, and I think that your book, it's very interesting also in order to address one of the most challenging issues nowadays for anthropology. That is how difference, linguistic and cultural difference is recreated in a globalized world. In a world that seems that every day is more and more homogeneous, but at the same time, uh, where the difference is circulating uh, at a global scale, and it's there, more local also. So thank you very much. I, I have learned it a lot uh, reading your book and also in this presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, the, the time is now running out, but uh, in connection of the term, uh, word foreign, we have a very good, uh, very interesting uh, question or remark from our Irish colleague. Uh, have you already read this text? Uh, the, the, the term foreign is out of date. It is one-sided. It is immediately problematic. And, and uh, later, uh, this uh, colleague says that uh, one of the most alienating expressions is foreign. Is it time to abandon the term foreign language? Yes, thank you very much for this very interesting and very important remark, Professor Maha. It is absolutely true, and I agree with this idea of foreign. In fact, I think I have lived in different countries before, and I think it is more and more uh, unacceptable to use the word foreign in other countries' contexts. And in Japanese context, I was shocked when I, I came back to Japan after 18 years abroad that a lot of expression, uh, a lot of um, text use the expression foreign as gaikokujin or gaikokuno. And I think it is a very um, kind of outdated uh, assumption as well that we can be foreign when we go out of our own country. So uh, drawing the boundary between uh, Japanese and foreign is something very um, um, difficult to manage when we are facing this diversity of the society. So I absolutely agree with this foreign uh, concept. It's becoming outdated. And also this Gai Dai Go, the first character of Gai comes from this idea of Gai Koku foreign. So this boundary uh, between the national and foreign, um, it's something that is about to change, I hope. And also this concept of Gai Dai Go might be um, discussed in different point of view. So thank you very much for this very interesting uh, comment about um, this concept of foreign. And I absolutely agree. And in the Japanese context, I, uh, I'm quite shocked by the fact that foreign is still very present in Japanese discourse, which I hope uh, will change in coming years. Thank you very yeah, much. We, we need to change completely the framework of perceiving the world in Japanese language, uh, which is uh, absolutely necessary uh, nowadays. Uh, and the time is running out, but just one more question, because we have uh, received a lot of questions, an uh, interesting one. And uh, the first one, uh, what happens when words with European origin are translated with kanji? I guess that your argument implies that such words uh, could be perceived not as outside within, but like an indigenous ones. For example, social distance can be translated into shakai tekikyori, 
rather than social distance in katakana? And do you think that they could have any different consequences? So thank you very much for this very important question as well. Um, so it is absolutely true that you pointed out that when a lot of words are actually translated in kanji uh, from uh, concepts that come from abroad, and this was particularly uh, pertinent while the Meiji Restoration, when Japan was first importing a lot of new concepts and words from uh, European languages. And the first the tendency was to translate these words in Sino-Japanese words using Chinese characters. And it is interesting, even today, when I look at the discussion about the long words, people's evaluations are quite different in terms of this kind of long translation they are much more um, accepting about these loan translation in Chinese characters. Even though they are not Japanese in origin, they think it is much better way of uh, translating or importing foreign words. So even the very um, strong critics of loan words, um, many of them think it is the better way to import the words um, because they say it is there is one step of translating, so digestion uh, of the meaning of the word. So it is interesting how people's perception change uh, when the words are translated uh, directly, transcribed directly, and translated into long translation, even though some of the very um, conceptual words, even translated in uh, characters, uh, they still are difficult to understand. So it is not only by changing the transcription into characters um, that we need, that we need to uh, make sure that terms are clear enough to understand, but it is absolutely true that people's reactions are quite different. And in terms of social distance, of course, this is a very uh, controversial word that actually WHO immediately corrected that social distance is not the correct word, but you have to use physical distance because it's not about social distance. But it kind of became a buzzword because it was the new expression. So it even became a buzzword in English speaking societies that in the context of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this concept of social distancing was introduced and kind of symbolized the society under the pandemic situation. So sometimes this uh, transcription of katakana can make a certain special um, association, special image of the description of the time. So it has different functions, but in terms of the uh, critics about the long words, uh, it changes, it, it uh, mitigates a lot when it is long translation. So uh, reaction, very different. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Naoko, and to discussants and the audience for these very lively discussions. Uh, since the time is now running up, uh, I need to wrap up today's uh, event. And uh, uh, the audience, don't uh, please don't believe that you understand completely the book. Uh, there are many other things to discuss uh, to have discussed uh, to have been discussed in this book. And please uh, read this book, even after today's uh, discussion, the presentation, introduction, and discussion. And uh, let's continue uh, to discuss on, the, on this very important uh, question about identity and the language, language and identity. Uh, thank you very much for your participation today, and see you next time. Bye-bye.